Welcome to worship at Lutheran Church of the Resurrection. We are gathered by Christ, growing in faith, sent to serve, empowered to witness. Our faith community welcomes all individuals, regardless of race, sex, gender identification, sexual orientation, economic status, age, disability, or family makeup. Child of God, you are welcome here. One of these days, you're going to break into spontaneous applause after that. How about some planned applause? There we go. <laughs> That's a beautiful mission statement, especially in the world that we live in today when the messages to um, actually most people are not a welcoming message. So when you think about it, um, maybe we didn't think about the power of our mission statement you know, for a while, but when you think about it today, it is a powerful message in the life of the world. Because if you think about all of those, those people and types of people and ways that people identify, um, a lot of those folks aren't welcome in our culture anymore, right? Maybe they never have been. Maybe uh, the veils of our culture's divisions are you know, being taken away a little bit. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I'm still studying the situation, and I'm sure the church is as well, and it probably changes <sighs> rapidly. Um, but every time I hear and speak that statement with all of us together, my heart feels light because I see that there's a place in the world where people are welcome. It's a beautiful thing. No spontaneous applause? Come on. <laughs> we don't have to be like totally Germanic Lutheran every moment, right? So I want to share something else funny. I don't think I ever account encountered any German Lutherans until I went to seminary. I did not grow up as a German Lutheran. I did not grow up in a German Lutheran congregation. I grew up in an English Lutheran congregation. And we were, we were more like Episcopalians in some ways in our polity than we were like German Lutherans. So it's really been an interesting shock to me um, to, to have settled in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> to work almost exclusively with German Lutheran congregations because, you know, there are a few little differences. Um, and one of those is um, we don't break out into spontaneous applause very often, so we're going to have to, to practice that. And um, I know that's a paradox because practicing something that's spontaneous, right, that's a little interesting, isn't it? Okay, so... Um, so good morning. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, my understanding is that there's good news from the zoning board. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. So that's really great news. Thanks to everybody who helped with that process. Um, that means that, um, that there is a way forward um, in something that has been a challenge for the congregation that doesn't have to be a challenge anymore. So we'll talk about that more and more as the weeks go by. Um, and now the, here's the temptation. The temptation is if we're accustomed to challenge and something moves a challenge, sometimes we get so anxious because the challenge is not there that we create a chal another challenge to take its place, right? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that happening? People are like, no, I've never noticed that happening. That's why it happens over and over again, right? So the idea when, is when a challenge moves out of the way is we break into... Complacency. What? Complacency. No, 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 no. That's not what we want to do. We want to break into... <laughs> You're just messing with me now, aren't you? <laughs> we break into spontaneous applause, which is another w a way of saying, thank you, God, we're so happy and we're celebrating. And we think about, now what can we do with this space that's been created? And this is going to be the challenge, the joy, and the opportunity of the transition process. And 
As of this Sunday, we are moving like a train into the transition process. We've spent almost a year working on repair, working on healing, working on stabilization, and guess what we're gonna do with all of that good stuff? That's right, but we're gonna shake it up first. We're gonna shake it up, because that's what God does, and if you notice the stories in the Bible, what happens is God works to stabilize a community in order to shake it up, to do something different, right? To do something different, to move forward. And if you trace, that's one of the most beautiful things about the Bible, if you trace the stories from Abraham on, you see that every time we encounter a new main character, it's because God is doing something new with the people. And so the story of God and people, what we call the salvation history, is a story about how God, over and over again, does something new. Creates, makes a new creation, causes something to die and rise again. And that's the pattern that God calls for God's people, is to be a dying and rising people. We learn that through the sacrament of what? Baptism. Holy baptism, beautiful. Um, we could also, if we wanted to, break into spontaneous applause for holy baptism. Um, because in holy baptism, God does something new with us every single day. So this is part of, of what we are going to be stressing and celebrating and working with. Um, I, would, I would consider that... Um, you ever hear, hear that story in the Old Testament when God says, I am the potter, you are the clay. Right? Guess what? We're the clay. We're the clay. That's right. That's right. And I'm not the potter, by the way. I'm probably the wheel. So, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Squeaky wheel. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we get a little spinny. Um, but I want you to know that as you are learning, I am also learning. Because there is never a time, even when we're teaching, that we don't learn. And we always teach what we need to learn. That's the humbling thing about being a teacher or a preacher. We need the good news we preach. We need the lessons that we teach. That, that's, you know, one of the, the powerful things about the way that God works with us. But I just wanted to pause during this time of welcome and announcement to let the congregation know that we are standing on the threshold of something new. So the hairs on my arm are standing up right now. And every time I come to this place with a congregation, the hairs on my arm stand up because I know that God is doing something powerful and wonderful in the lives of congregations. Amen. Oh, I love it. Thank oh, you. <laughs> Thank you, but Di Donato. <laughs> Beautiful. So um, I'm going to stop here because I know every single person sitting in this room has come into the, the transition event, right? Yes. Yes. Right? And if you're not, I want you to talk to me after the service so I can talk you into it. Because I do that, right? Yes. And, and you should be glad for that, right? Because that, you need somebody who's going to talk you into something when you're feeling a little resistant. So um, let's talk about prayer concerns today. Um, tell me your name again, my dear. Beth. Beth. Thank you, Beth. It takes me like three times. And your mom, Floss, had a fall. And she's okay now. So we keep Beth and Floss in our prayers. And then Valda, you share that Jim had a fall yesterday. So we keep Jim in prayer. Who else needs to be in prayer today? Mary? Yes. 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 Oh, your family has been through so much, Mary. 
Absolutely. Well, we keep the family in prayer and also celebration for Delaine's wedding on Saturday. So joy in the midst of sorrow, um, which happens so often in life. Candy, did you have something? Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, we keep Judy Dallas in prayer. Who else are we praying for today? Uh, two, uh, two prayers on the opposite side. Uh, one, a prayer of thanksgiving for the consideration on the zoning board uh, by a unanimous vote of five to nothing to variation. So, oh. Beautiful. And that's why they were fined? That's why they were fined. They did not meet the definition of a house of worship. Yeah. Wow. That's real Christian. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to have to think about that for a while. Wow. That's disgusting. Well, you know, and, and, and for a governmental authority to try to define who we are and what we do... And that seems pretty, well, yeah, but that seems pretty counter to the First Amendment to the Constitution, so, oh my goodness. All right, Bud, I know you got your hand up, too, and Ruth. I'm going to go first. Um, let's start with prayers of thanksgiving for my um, Uncle Earl celebrating his 94th birthday after several bouts of pneumonia in the hospital. Okay. On her neck. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we keep them in prayer. Others? Bud? I have good news. I okay. have finally decided they were wrong in denying my surgery for pacemaker. And they, uh, in January, I got, I, you know, on Monday, I got a call that uh, they approved it. So uh, we'll be doing that on August 8th. Beautiful, Bud. That's great news. Great news. <laughs> Others to share about today? Anybody? Else? Okay, yes, Kay. Um, I'm so sorry. Okay, we pray for Kay's husband. He's not well. What's that? Yeah, and he's going to have a procedure. Others to share about today? Um, I have a couple of my own. Um, We had another death in our family. So um, this is my mother. You know, we have kind of a small family, so. You know, when that happens, it, it feels um, like a lot. So my mother's oldest cousin, Lubo, um, who lives in Sweden, um, he died on the 9th. And then my brother's surgery has been scheduled for September 15th. Some of you may know about this. He has to have his esophagus removed. And um, so I, that's really weighing on me. I mean, it's a, it feels like, it feels serious to me. So, um, and he's a young guy, he's younger than I am. Um, but that may, that may be a positive toward his healing. So I keep that, I keep that in prayer. Others, anyone else? Yes, Susan. Okay, we keep your sister-in-law in prayer. Cindy, okay. We keep her in prayer as well. And as we hear, there are many, many things um, that we ask God to hold in God's care and God's embrace um, as we gather for worship today. Let's rise for our order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. 
Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting ourselves before others, we long to take I'm sorry, instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, your mercy delights us, and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need, and turn our hearts to love our neighbors with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated. A reading from Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get for us 
so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe the word of the Lord. Second reading is from Galatians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, you have heard of this hope before the word of truth, the gospel, that has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. So it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And he has made known to us your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in knowledge of God. May you be be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Lord, you, Lord. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. and When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, 
And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children forward. A piggy unicorn. Oh my gosh. I've never seen a unicorn like that before. Where'd you get that? From Home Goods. Huh. Do you recommend Home Goods as a good place to buy stuff? Yes, she does. There we go. And Nathan, how are you? Good, good. And how about you, Brooke? How are you doing? You're doing good too? Hey, Grandma, how are you doing? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Good. Everybody's doing well today, or pretty well, or a little bit well. And even if we're not doing so well, God is here, so guess what? Spontaneous applause. That's right. Do you like to clap? Uh oh. Uh oh. What's that all about? How come you don't like to clap? You don't know. It's okay. It's okay. You're raising her to be a good Lutheran. That's all right. We're going to learn about clapping a little later, but not today. How about you, Nathan? Do you like to clap? He doesn't really like it, but it's not terrible. Okay, how about you, Brooke? Do you like to clap? Really? What about you, Grandma? You want to do jazz hands? How about jazz hands? Are jazz hands better? No. It's okay. It's okay. So we have a really, really cool story in the gospel today that Jesus tells. He talks about a neighbor. If I were to ask you what a neighbor is, what would you tell me? Who's a neighbor? Someone um, that's, um, I don't know. I don't know. That's okay. You know what? It's fine. The, you know, the guy in the story didn't know who a neighbor was. What would you say if I asked you what's a neighbor? Who's a neighbor? Okay, somebody who lives in your neighborhood or next to you in a different house, basically. Okay, that's a good definition. What do you think, Brooke? I don't know. It's okay. So, good definition, Nathan. You know, our neighbors are all around us. Did you know that? Our neighbors are all around us. And sometimes they're the people we least expect and the people that we probably maybe even don't want to have as a neighbor because we're like that as people, right? Sometimes we decide there's people we don't want to know, right? Is there anybody you don't want to know? No. Good answer. How about you, Nathan? Any No. How about you, Brooke? No? Are you telling me the truth? Or are you giving me the church answer? What do you think? So, here, this is the other thing I want to tell you. Sometimes the stories we hear in the Bible, they challenge us. You know what a challenge is? It's hard to define a challenge, isn't it? But we don't usually, we don't always like a challenge, right? Because we like things the way we like it, right? Do you like things the way you like it? Yes. What about you, Brooke? Do you like things the way you like it? How about you guys out there? Do you like things the way you like it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Yes? Yeah. Clyde, Clyde's given me, you know what? Yeah, sometimes Clyde likes adventure and new things, right? Yeah, you do. Um, so, but that's what you like, right? Right? Okay. Yeah, definitely. So, we like what we like. But Jesus is always challenging us to question those things to see if there might be something different and even sometimes something better than what we already know, right? So um, who likes Brussels sprouts? Who hates Brussels sprouts? 
You've never had them, really? Would you like to try them? Grandma, you got an experiment this week. Uh huh. She, oh, oh. <laughs> Brooke is a tough. It's okay. How about lima beans? Who likes lima beans? Who hates lima beans? You don't. Do you know lima beans? You don't know lima. Would you like to try lima beans? No. No. Why not? No bad. Because why? One, one time when I tried celery, I knew I wasn't going to like it, and I, and I didn't like it. So like, every time when I try something new, I think I don't like it. Okay. Time, so. Yeah, that, there she, you got it. That's the human condition. And you'll learn what the human condition means when you're older, but it's good that you know it when you're a child. The human condition is, is we don't always like to try something new because we might not like it, Right? But you don't know till you try. But who wants to take the chance that you might not like it? <laughs> so, you know, we talked about vegetables here, right? And some of us don't like to try fruit either. I remember that. She's looking at me. Yeah, I remember. Um, but Jesus is telling us it's bigger than just those things. It's also about the people we might think we might not like or know, but you know what? They're still a child of God, right? They're still a child of God. And you know what a child of God is to us? A neighbor and maybe even a brother or a sister, part of our family. And so Jesus is inviting us to think a little differently to try something differently. And he tells us a story that is shocking to get our attention. To get our attention. Because somebody who's a priest or a pastor or a leader in church, like a reader or a, you know, a treasurer or a council president or a Sunday school teacher, they should do the right thing, right? But guess what? Ugh. Sometimes we don't do the right thing. And so Jesus is reminding us that there is another way to think. That there's another possibility. And he's encouraging us not to just think about the people and vegetables and fruits and things like that that we don't like. But to remember that there's a little bit of God in everybody. And when we help, we see God in a bigger way. Can we remember that? When we help somebody, even somebody we think we're not going to like, we're going to see God in a bigger way. Let's have a prayer. Shall we have a prayer? Okay. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for the ways that you teach us to help us to learn the things that we might not know, to help us to learn again the things we do know but that we might not like, and to help us to remember that in each person, there's a little bit of you. That each person is our brother and sister. That each person is our neighbor. And we pray, O oh Lord our God, that you help people to love each other better. And help us to be kind. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, my friends. I'll see you later, alligators. So before we have a prayer, before the official preaching begins, um, I want to just let you know that you are already at the transition event, that our worship service is part of our transition event today. And every time we gather for a transition event, it is one unified activity that we do together from worship to moving into the next space, 
to what we do in the next space. And everything about a transition event is intentional. Everything is planned, from the invitation, to the worship service, to the decorations, to the things you're going to find on your table when you get there. Because every little thing we do, God works with that to help shape us. God works with that to help make us a new creation. God, God works with that to help to teach us. And by understanding, I'm going to stop every now and then and say, hey, look at this. This is what is a good thing to learn from this. By looking at everything we do on the morning of a transition event as the transition event, as the time of learning, as the time of teaching, as the time of transformation, as the time of growth, we understand from this that there is no separation for us between what we do in here and what we do out there and what we do as we're moving from here to there. Which is why it's ludicrous to say that feeding the poor is not an activity of a house of worship. Because if these people knew their Bible, they would know that God says, I hate your feasts and your worship service. Feed the poor. Let justice roll down like waters. You know, it's right there. Anyway, I'm not going to go there because that's not my sermon today. But we learn a little bit of everything, and it's on my mind what you said. I mean, what you said actually happened is really on my mind. Um, and it kind of goes with our reading today as well. Um, lots to think about. Um, lots to think about. Our Old Testament reading today begins with a promise. It begins with a promise. It also begins with an ending that opens the way to a new beginning. A lot of people don't realize that the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' parting words to the people of Israel as he moves to the end of his time with them, the end of their time of active liberation, covenant creation, moving through the wilderness. Because if you remember, Moses did not cross into the promised land with the people of Israel. But God that did take him to a high place so that he could see it. So that he did not die not knowing that the people would get to where God promised them they would be. It's a powerful, powerful um, teaching for all of us and experience for all of us to live again with the people of Israel. So the, this Old Testament reading begins with an ending that creates a beginning. And Moses, what he's trying to do in the book of Deuteronomy is it's like he's getting all of these last words in. Don't forget this. Don't forget this. Remember this. Remember this. Remember this. Remember this. It's kind of like what happens when, and none of it's new. Let's, let's just say that right away. None of it's new. He's, he's done this with the people all before. But it's kind of like, so I remember when my mother was dying, I wanted to make sure she knew I loved her, <laughs> right? We have spent a lifetime showing each other that we love each other. But there was something about that ending point. I wanted to make sure she knew. I wanted to make sure she carried that with her into her next part of her journey carried that love and knew it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And this is really what Moses is doing. He is making sure, or as much as he can, that the people carries as much with them of what he has sought to taught them, of what their time together has taught them and shown them about this incredible love of God. And not just about God's incredible love, but also their part in the story. And it's so interesting what we encounter here, because one of the things that Moses lifts up for the people is um, their resistance. <laughs> because that's one thing about us. A lot of times when God challenges us with something new, we can, we can feel that resistance. 
coming up inside of us. And the way that Moses characterizes resistance is as a perception of distance. It's a perception of distance. You don't have to climb a high mountain. You don't have to cross an ocean. The word is very near you. The word is very near you, in you and on your heart. And one of the things that Moses also wants to leave with the people in this part of the story is that the love of God and the relationship with God is not a passive thing. It's a participatory thing. It's not passive. It doesn't happen to us. We are participants in God's love. We are participants. God's love is an active thing. It's not a passive thing. It's not something that just falls like manna from heaven and sits on the ground untouched. Yes, it falls from heaven and rests upon the ground. But we must what? Pick it up and do what with it? Eat it. And can we wait? No, because what happens if you wait? It, dis- it, it gets moldy and icky, right? But guess what happens the next day? More falls. More falls. It's a never-ending resource. So that's where things open up. As we encounter our second reading today, Paul is beginning a correspondence with a church that he actually may never likely have visited. I, I found that was interesting as I was doing some reading about this. Um, he was initiating a relationship. And the thing about Paul and his church planting and, and the way he delegated some of the church planting was he always kept in touch with what was going on in the churches, whether he planted them or not, or whether one of his deputies planted them. And Paul writes this letter to the Colossians because he hears sort of he sees sort of what's happening as they're being shaped by the spirit and their experience. And if you think about, have you ever seen a potter throw a pot on the wheel? And and it's going so well, right? It's taking shape beautifully. And then all of a sudden something gets weird and it just starts to look funky. Have you ever seen that with a potter's wheel? So that's kind of what's happening with the Colossians is they're being well shaped, but then all of a sudden something funky happens and they're not really kind of turning into the, into the properly shaped vessel. And that has to do with theology. That's, you know, their, their Christology, how they think about Jesus. And that's more a Bible study topic than it is a preaching topic. But I think it's important for us to understand where Paul's words are coming from. And that is he's hearing that the people in this congregation, in this church at Colossae, have a misunderstanding about who Jesus is. And the problem is, is that when we have misunderstandings about who Jesus is, we don't always receive the fullness of the grace of that experience because our minds and our, and our experience become limited by a misunderstanding. Kind of like when you misunderstand what a house of worship is all about. I'm going to get that in there again. Because that's a real world example of what Paul is talking about. What can happen when we don't understand who Jesus is, who we are, and what that means for the life of the world. New beginnings can come only when we acknowledge endings. Whether it's the ending of one part of a journey, whether it's an ending of one way that we've understood God to come to a new understanding of who God is and how God loves us, kind of like what happened when Jesus came into the life of the world. 
An ending that can create a new beginning can be an understanding that a church or a congregation has about itself and a place in the world, its place in the world. For a congregation, a natural ending comes when a pastor leaves. And before a new settled pastor comes, and there is a time of what we call transition, learning, growth, transformation. Are we abandoned by God in this? Are we leaderless? Do we not have a pastor? Oh, please, Lord, say, <laughs> yes, we have a pastor. I can't tell you how many congregations think they don't have a pastor when they're in transition. You just have a different kind of pastor, one who um, does really active work with you and holds space for a very dynamic time of growth. One might say that Moses was a transition pastor. What do you think? And I use his work with the people over and over because it is so resonant with the work that we do together. And I just read recently that now the time between the resurrection and Pentecost is being considered another time of transition that congregations in transition can look to to learn about what it means to be in a between space. And a between space is not a non-space, but a between space is a not anymore and not yet space. And that is not a passive space. As a matter of, t of fact, congregations are usually required to be even more dynamic in their response. The resistance is huge, though, because a lot of people want to wait and see what happens. A lot of people want to just take a break from church until the next pastor comes. But what happens when there's that kind of response is this tremendous opportunity to work dynamically with the spirit to bring about powerful change in the life of a congregation can be missed. And people can sometimes say, well, you know what? I don't want to change. I don't want to change. But guess what? The change is upon us, right? We can see it, can't we? Never mind the obvious lack of the same person in the pulpit, but all kinds of things have changed. And we see that especially now because the church, not just congregations in a pastoral transition, but every congregation in the nation is in a transition right now because everything has changed for the world. COVID was a life-changing, culture-changing, system-changing, world-changing event. And most of us just want to go back to the way it was before COVID. But some of us can see the opportunity we may not see what the end result is going to be like, but we can see that God is working there. And that's the power of this moment. That's the power of this moment for every congregation on the face of the earth. And that's the power of this moment in double dose for this congregation with a pastoral transition plus the COVID transitions. Why am I talking about transition on a day when we're talking about the Good Samaritan? And you're probably wondering, is she ever going to get there? Yes. First of all, parables. Parables are not allegories. Parables are stories that Jesus told to turn our lives upside down. They're designed to turn the world upside down. When you have chewed on a parable, you are a different person afterwards than you were before probably can be is that some of these parables are some of our favorite old stories. 
So we end up resting on an interpretation of a parable that we really like. And I think the parable of the Good Samaritan is probably the prime story. Maybe the lost sheep is a, is a good second, but the Good Samaritan, we think we know what that's about. All right, what's the Good Samaritan about? Come on. What's it about? Helping, helping other people. What else? What, what's it about? What's that? Love. Love, absolutely. Okay. Um, we usually think about the Good Samaritan, this parable, as a call to attend to those in need. A call to be merciful. A call to help our neighbor. And give that neighbor whatever that neighbor needs. But who's our neighbor? So I had an interesting thought about this parable. What if Jesus told this story to help us to think about how we're receiving him? This new way that God wants us to see the relationship with God. Can we step back from what we normally think about this parable and think about something new? The reason I got to thinking about this was, first of all, the question, who is my neighbor? And the second reason is because I've always been troubled by the priest and the Levite walking on the other side of the road. Based on what? Based on the law or based on an interpretation? interpretation? Yeah. Based on an interpretation of the law. Jesus was always challenging how people interpreted, right? Because you are to love the Lord your God with all your what? Strength. And your. So if you were actually following the law and you loved your neighbor as yourself, wouldn't you help the guy on the road? Yes. Except there was an interpretation that said that serving on the altar with ritual purity was important. So this was the interpretation, right? Jesus came into the life of the world to show us something new about how we've been relating to God and each other. Who were the people who were receiving that word wholeheartedly? Was it the Pharisees and the Levites? No. Was it most of the Jewish people? It was, it was the Gentiles, right? I mean, look at how rapidly the church grew beyond Jerusalem. Those were the people, the people that, that the, so let's not get into any kind of, I'm, I'm not trying to be anti-Semitic here, so let me just, you know, let's, let's just get this out of the way right away. Um, you have people who have a relationship and experience with God, that relationship and experience becomes codified. It becomes <clears throat> filled with tradition, right? Tradition. 
our way of looking at things, our understanding of what God has told us is the right way to live, the right things to do, and the right way to do the right way. And this is really the problem. It's not doing the right thing. It's doing the right thing in the right way. Do you follow me here? I know it sounds really kind of crazy and confusing. But I think this is really important. And I think this is really important for us because if we think about God's revelation in the life of the world as someone who's been beaten, stripped, and left by the side of the road and passed by by the people who are supposed to know and love God best, best, then that gives us a new way to interact with this material. And I'm not saying we throw out the old understandings, but I think God is always peeling away at the layers of our understandings to give us new ways to understand something in a new time so we can live more dynamically in relationship with God and our neighbor. What if God and this, this relationship with God is also our neighbor? What if the ways that we interact with this God who loves us so dearly our traditions, our ways of being, our ways of understanding, what if that also was a neighbor? Could God be inviting us into a new relationship with our relationship with God? Might that not turn our worlds upside down? And if we come to understand that our interpretation is of, of how we relate to God and each other is something that God wants us to examine again and again and again, to minister to again and again and again, to heal and to bring back into full health and vitality. Might that be something that Jesus is eagerly inviting us into? I think about this because of what's before us today. What's before us today? This is our heritage event today. We are going to be looking at the things that have shaped us as a congregation, the things that have made us who we are today. We are going to be looking at the ways that we have interpreted our life together over years and what that has brought us to. And I wonder. Might there be an invitation for us today to pick up our old life, our poor, broken old life, up off the road, to give it some comfort and care and nourishment and healing, and to see what vibrant good health and vitality the life of our congregation might move into because we have taken that care with it. Hallelujah. That, what's that? Say again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There you go. That's the invitation. That's the invitation today. Our life together with God, our wonderful, beloved congregation, how might we tend that today? Provide it care, nourishment, and healing so that it might be able to step into vibrant new life. And who are we in that story? Are we the ones who are going to hold so tightly to tradition that we pass by and don't even acknowledge what's there on the road in front of us? Are we the ones who hold so tightly to our interpretation and our own understandings? Or can we look upon our congregation with the new eyes the fresh eyes of a newcomer and a stranger. 
in order to see something we may not have seen before and to bring the healing, nourishment, and care that will bring that into new vitality and new life. Let's pray. Wondrous God, you invite us to see with new eyes, to hear with open ears and an open mind and heart, to touch with refreshed hands, to walk with refreshed feet into new possibility. You peel away the layers of our resistance and the distance that stands between us and each other, the distance that possibly stands between us and vitality. We pray, O oh Lord God, this day that you brood upon your people here as we gather to celebrate the heritage of this congregation as we celebrate what has shaped us, as we welcome an ending and step across the space of new beginnings, taking with us those things of value and leaving behind what no longer serves you, us, or the neighbor. We pray that you give us courage. We pray that you give us grace. We pray that you give us faith, and we pray above all that you help us to see that you are here at the table with us this day. In your holy name we pray, amen. in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Good and gracious God, we have placed your word of love in the heart of your church. Fill your church with compassion that we bear the fruit of your healing mercy to a broken world. God of grace, 
You created the earth with seeds sprouting up with new life. We pray for the flourishing of fruit trees and orchards, vines and bushes. Prosper the work of those who plant, tend, harvest, and gather. God of grace, show us your ways and teach us your paths of justice and love. Raise up community and national leaders to challenge and dismantle social structures that perpetuate ethnic, racial, and religious profiling and discrimination. God of grace. Come near to all in need. Orchestrate kindness in the face of cruelty, hope where there is despair, love in the face of neglect, comfort where there is death, and healing in illness. God of grace. Turn this community toward neighbors in need. Bring aid and support to those who are poor, beaten down, abused, forgotten, silenced, or avoided. God of grace. We give thanks for the saints who revealed your love and mercy in this life. Inspired by their witness, strengthen us to live in hope. God of grace. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. At this time in the service, we normally collect the offering. Due to safety protocols to meet the current public health crisis, we are collecting the offering in a box near the entrance to the sanctuary, or through checks mailed to the church, or on the online giving platform tithe.ly. We thank you for your continuing faithfulness in giving and take time here and now to lift up God's goodness and all God's good gifts. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite the congregation to rise. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his Holy Supper. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. This is the body of Christ given for you and for me. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you and for me. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. And thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And thank you for worshiping with us today, whether you've been worshiping here in person with us through our live stream or later on the recording. We have been blessed by your presence. Just one little word before I dismiss the congregation. We'll be moving directly into the fellowship hall, and I invite you to find a seat and to sit down. And I'm going to be greeting folks there at the event rather than outside of worship like I usually do. So we send you all today with a blessing. Christ will